Oh, hello. In this episode, we are talking to master dog trainer, Nate Shoma. If you have a dog and you're looking to improve their scent detection or their truffle hunting capabilities, then this video is for you. Uh, with Nate, we go and dive deep into talking about all things uh, truffle dog training, scent detection training, you know, how to do the indication, how to develop drive in your dog. When should you start the truffle dog training with your dog? When should you move from like at home to in the field? All these little questions, which, you know, are amazing to find out from somebody who's such at the top of their game uh, in the dog world, in the dog training world. Uh, Nate was somebody that I learned from two or three years ago. He put out a load and still does put out a load of great content on his YouTube channel. Go check him out. He's got a great YouTube channel. And a lot of those principles to do with market training, scent detection training, um, obedience, what is positive reinforcement? What is positive punishment? He goes deep into explaining the science behind dog training, uh, which for me, once you learn the science, then it gives you the tools and the equipment as a dog handler, as a dog trainer, to then be able to problem solve, you know, whatever problems come up. So it's it's fantastic the way that he explains that on this episode. So I highly encourage you to watch it. It's a long one. Uh, there's a long introduction as well with Nate, uh, which for me was fascinating hearing about his background, his story, how he got into it, the dog training schools that he went to, which sounds just amazing. Uh, but also um, you can skip ahead as well to the bits that you find entertaining and uh, more to do with yourself. Um, and without further ado, I will hand you on. But if you like this episode, you know, um, there's more content like this coming out from Truffle Forager. We've got a podcast um, doing weekly podcasts or striving to do weekly podcasts. Join the email list as well. Go to truffleforager.com and you can get notified with updates about all the content that's coming out. And enjoy this episode and I'll see you on the other side. Cheers. Bye. So, Nate, welcome to the welcome to the podcast, the Truffle Forager podcast. I, I'm uh... I'm super happy and excited that you, uh, you know, accepted my invitation to come on the show. You know, I've been a big fan, uh, watched your videos on YouTube and been an avid student of yours. And to be honest, you, you, you really um, taught me quite a lot of pivotal things that I didn't, I wasn't even aware of before. So to get the chance to speak to you now and pick your brain uh, around dogs, dogs training, scent training, all of that juicy stuff. I'm very excited. So welcome. Oh, thank you. I'm always happy to talk about dogs. And to use a, a cliche saying, I've had the opportunity to stand on the shoulders of giants within the industry. So that's contributed quite a bit to my knowledge and understanding of dog training. So I think it's appropriate to give credit where credit is due. I've had some of the best mentors, and that really made a huge impact on my career. But I appreciate you saying that, and I'm happy the YouTube videos have been beneficial. Definitely for me, and I'm sure many, many others as going by your subscriber count at, at the least, you know, it's growing very quickly. Um, what I wanted to ask you is, um, I, I'm just generally curious of, you know, I think you, your video started really pushing out just a few years ago. And, and but how long have you been doing your dog training? And, and, and how did you even get started with dog training in general? What brought you to it? Yeah, I've been training dogs professionally since 2012. And just like most people within the animal or dog industry, we've had that passion for a long time since childhood. And I was in the Marine Corps for eight years. After the Marine Corps, I got out and I started doing post-production in Los Angeles as a compositor, which was a cool and interesting job, but sitting inside of an office all day just really wasn't doing it for me. And since I've always been interested in dogs and had a passion for dogs, I remember I would be sitting at my computer desk and there was one job that I had. I was a freelance artist, so I bounced around to multiple different studios. And there was this one studio, it was a relatively large one in LA and they would have tons of artists on a job even when they wouldn't need that many. So they would have two dozen when they only needed a dozen. So a lot of times you would just be sitting there killing time waiting for different jobs to come in and they would send one job and you might knock it out in 20 minutes and now you have another 40 minutes to just hang out so I would watch a lot of dog training videos, whether it was on YouTube or, you know, Cesar Milan, everybody watches him that's interested in dog training. And someone came up to me, looked over my shoulder and said, you know, you should probably do something with dogs because every time I look at your computer, you're researching dog training. And um, lucky for me, one of my friends has a successful dog training business out in Chicago where I had grown up. And he came out to visit myself and another one of my friends and we're hanging out and he's telling me about his facility and what he's doing. And I was widely impressed at the success that he's had within the industry. And he said, you know, you should come out and spend some time at the training facility. 
And I said, okay. And I took him up on it and I drove out. I brought my dogs and another dog that was in LA that was having trouble. It was a pit bull and my buddy specialized in pit bulls. And so I told the owners that I was going to go out there and I could bring their dog and he could work with them and fix the issues that they're having, which was uh, aggression issues. So I brought this dog out, spent three weeks at his facility, and it just made sense to me, the training and how to work with dogs. There was just this connection I think I had from the very beginning, whether it was from my obsessive passion as a kid. Everywhere we would go, I would want to take treats for the dogs when I would visit family in North Carolina. I would have to stop at the local pet store and grab a big bag of treats. So when everybody else was inside talking, I was outside with the dogs, hanging out. And that was something that I always loved. And I was talking to him about a, a mutual friend of ours that had a dog that pulled on the leash and they wanted me to help fix it. And you know, keep in mind, I wasn't a professional dog trainer at the time, but I knew some of the basics from watching my buddy, Jeff Hankinson, by the way, is his name. Awesome trainer. Anyone in Chicago, they should definitely look him up. It's Dog Style Incorporated, easy name to remember. And so I was putting a collar on this dog and it was a, a little poodle type dog and the dog was biting at my hands when I was going to put the collar on. But the dog was what I like to call a bluffing dog, one that will act out a certain behavior in order to get a desired response from the human. And if we respond the way the dog wants us to, which in that case is not putting the collar on the dog, then we know that that's going to strengthen that behavior and the dog will continue to practice it. And so I just ignored the dog biting at me. I'm thinking to myself, you're a little dog. I'm not too worried about it. I put the collar on and I started working with the dog and I told Jeff about this later. And as I was explaining it to him, I remember he threw his pen up in there and he's like, dude, this stuff makes sense to you. He says, we're not getting any younger. Why don't you consider making a career out of this? So I thought about it and then I asked him for his advice. I said, well, if I wanted to become a dog trainer, what would be the fastest way I could possibly do it? And he said, well, a good way to get started is to go to a school. And he said, the two best schools in the United States that I'm aware of is the Michael Ellis School for Professional Dog Trainers and the Tom Rose School for Professional Dog Trainers. So I looked up both schools and the Tom Rose School accepted the GI Bill. And since I had the GI Bill, that made perfect sense to me. So I signed what, up for the Tom what's Rose What's the GI Bill, sorry? Oh, so the GI Bill is what we have as veterans in the United States. If you get out honorably, you have the GI uh -huh. Bill, which you can use to go to school. So they cover the cost of school. And I also put in for what was called the post 9-11 GI Bill. So I had signed up before 9-11 and the post 9-11 GI Bill, if you put in for it, then you would not only have uh, your school covered, but they would also pay you while you're going to school. So I, I was, I think it was roughly um, 3000 a month that I was given while going to the school and the school was covered. So I didn't have to worry about anything but focusing on dog training, which was perfect because I spent, yeah. I'm not an early riser. So the school started at 9 a.m. So I would get there at 9 a.m., but I would train till 10 p.m pretty much every single day. The biggest criticism that I had from the instructors was I was overtraining the dogs. And you also have to keep in mind that I came from a military mentality. I was a drill yeah. instructor when I got out. So my mindset was you train them till they get it. Well, it doesn't work that way with dogs. You can't overtrain them or <laughs> yeah. else you're going to go, you know, you're going to reverse your training progress and it's going to take you significantly longer and you can damage the dog and decrease motivation and it's all bad. So uh, that was my biggest critique, and once they told me I was overtraining the dogs, I went out and got a few more dogs. So while going to the school, I had six dogs that I could rotate wow. and practice with. So these were your I your could... dogs, or yeah, so or well, you two just of the... like hired two some of... dogs, or <laughs> what was going on here? <laughs> well, two dogs were the dogs that I went to the school with, and then I purchased two more dogs for the course. So I had two golden retrievers. And then I had a Dutch Shepherd puppy that I got. So that was the first dog that I mm -hmm. took through the course. And you had to have two green dogs to go through the course. One dog had to pass certain requirements, and then the other dog had to pass certain requirements. And it was to show that you could train more than just one dog. And this is on top mm -hmm. of training um, pet dogs as well. So he has another company, Tom Rose, the founder of the school, Doghouse Incorporated, where locals within the area could have their dogs trained and he offers it at a discounted rate because the locals know that the students are training the dogs. But you don't get a dog to train from the doghouse until you've proven that you can train. 
So you're not getting it the first day that you get to the school. Usually after about two months or so, sometimes three months, then the students will start getting what they call IKTs. I call stay and train, but essentially where somebody drops off their dog, you work with the dog for a few weeks, they pick up the dog, you do a go home lesson, and then they have to carry on the training to make sure it doesn't go away. And um, so you have those, and then you have, of course, the dogs that you're working with. So I had four, and that's when I was overtraining. And then I went out and got two more. So I got them from uh, like a local rescue that the school worked with. So I trained mm -hmm. them essentially for the rescue, but I had them as long as I wanted. And then the rescue took them back and rehomed them. So it was a great deal. It worked out for me because I had more time to practice and work on the skill. And it worked out for the rescue because their dogs were trained, which makes it much easier to adopt a dog out that's been trained instead of one that yeah, has yeah. behavioral issues. Uh, and for so these, for were me, these all in your, in your house or did you keep them at the school or a bit of both? I'm just imagining yeah, six. Six yeah, dogs at, at home. The, the, <laughs> the way the school is, so he has on-campus housing. And he had purchased uh, pieces of property around the school. So there was a house down the street and I was renting out one of the rooms and pretty much every room in the house had a student renting and the living room was divided into two. So th that was also made into two rooms. And some people would complain about the living conditions. They would say things like, oh, you have to stay in a human kennel. And to me, I'm thinking, quit your complaining. You're here to learn how to train dogs. You're not here to sit in luxury all day in your room. Mm. Like, you should only be in your room to sleep and store your equipment. And so my room was basically all crates and a bed because I had all the dogs. Nice. And according to the school policy, you couldn't leave dogs out because it was a safety issue. So the dogs had to be crated when they were left alone in the room. And so I graduated top of my class in the professionals. Only one student graduated with a higher score than me and faster than me. And this guy is such an exceptional dog trainer that I don't feel bad that he beat me. He beats pretty much everybody. He went out, he became a very big competitor within AKC as well as PSA, which is Protection Sport Association. It's an American protection sport. Although some of the European sports are still most popular, like French ring, Schutzen, Mondio ring. But PSA is growing in popularity and every single competition that this guy would enter, he would get first place. It didn't matter what he was competing in, he would take first place. And I remember one time he received second place and everybody was looking at him going, what happened, man? Why'd you get second? Because <laughs> he always would get first. So losing to him wasn't a big deal. And then um, I did the master program as well, graduated top of my class in the master program, set up a dog training program with Tom Rose, which was also a great way to continue learning. So I tried doing, uh, this was before trying to do anything on YouTube, we created a dog training app. Now the problem with the app was it was so large that it really didn't get that many downloads and it wasn't connected to the internet. So meaning it wasn't streaming the videos from the internet, it was all on the app. So it was a really big app that people would have to commit to downloading and it didn't do as well as we had hoped it would do. But anyways, I moved back to LA and I set up a business called Orion Canine Academy that primarily focused on pet obedience. It was doing really well and it goes to show that a business name plays a big role within the success of the business. I don't know what it was about Orion Canine Academy, but it did really good with the organic SEO. And so I had a two month waiting list. Things were going great. Tom reached back out to me, asked me if I want to come back to the school to be an assistant instructor. And to me, and he wasn't going to be paying me much. He even said, he's like, the pay is not going to be great, but you can come back down. You can do the advanced masters and uh, you can be an assistant instructor. And I was all on it because that's just more education for me. I didn't really mm -hmm. care about the pay. That was just a little extra bonus. And so I went back to the school, did that for a while. That's when I had the chance to uh, be mentored by Dave Van Garderen. So he's the instructor now at a school in Missouri called Kennelwood Academy. And he's one of the best dog trainers I've ever worked with. You talk about someone who truly understands dogs, how they think, how they process information, how to train them. But then, of course, how to teach others to become dog trainers. So working with him every day was incredible. And his unwaving commitment to training and his i guess you could say um contagious you know his motivation was quite contagious let me put it that way 
you know, every day, once we finished training the, uh, I almost called them recruits, training the students in the morning, when they would break for lunch, right when we would break them for lunch, he would look at me and be like, you want to go grab the dogs for protection work? All right. So I'd go grab a few dogs. We would do protection during lunch. We would eat a quick lunch and then we would go back to training the students. So every window of opportunity we had to do additional training. I mean, he was on it. And like I said, his motivation was contagious because some people, they can decrease your motivation. He had quite mm. the opposite effect. So I did that for a while. Then I went to Colorado. I helped set up a dog training business out there called uh, Denver Dog Training. I worked with another dog training business out there, stayed there for about a year or so. And then I moved back to California in 2015, set up a nonprofit called Here is Legacy Foundation that wasn't really that successful because no one knew what it was. And people would pronounce it the wrong way. They'd go, what, what is Hira's legacy? You know, so it, the name does have quite an impact on a business, unless you're already, you know, widely successful and popular, then maybe it doesn't have as much. But at the time, I wasn't as well known. So I, I was also doing, you know, dog training as well as the nonprofit. 2017, Animal Planet reached out to me. Well, not Animal Planet. Plimsoll Production Company, which is a UK production company. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the show in the UK. They did one season called Rescue Dog to Super Dog. And so they wanted to bring that show to the American audience. And the production company reached out. And I, I had been contacted by a couple production companies for different shows. And I'd always respond and I would do a Zoom. I would talk to them. It would be great. We'd have a good conversation. And then I would never hear from them again. And so mm -hmm. this one, we set up a Zoom. I talked to them for about 20 minutes or so, give or take. They said, great. If anything comes up, we'll reach back out. Not long after, they reached out. They said, we really like you. We want to do a sizzle reel with you. And I said, cool, whatever that is. So we scheduled the time to do a sizzle reel, which a sizzle reel is kind of like a pilot episode. So it's like it's, it's similar to the concept of pitching the show. But a sizzle reel is significantly shorter and they don't have to do as long. Like they don't have to do a full episode because they already have the show established elsewhere. So since it was already a show in the UK, they could show potential buyers of the show, I guess you would call it. So the actual uh, network that would be showing the show, they can say, here is the show that we produced in the UK. And now here is a sizzle reel with the two trainers that we would like to use for the American audience. And so they sent that to Discovery. The head of Discovery saw it, he approved it. And then I got a call not too long after that, maybe a few weeks from the executive producer. And she said, congratulations, you have a show on Animal Planet. I was like, holy cow, this is unbelievable. And so we did one season. It was awesome, such a great learning experience. I mean, Animal Planet is a great company to work with as well as Plimsoll Production Company. So I had a lot of fun with that. Finished that up. Then I started working with a nonprofit called Cammies and Canines. And Cammies and Canines' mission was to help homeless veterans and pair them up with rescue dogs to improve the life of both. Because mm. um, that attracted me, of course, because I'm a veteran as well, but also the passion for dogs. So I would work and train and help with the dogs. We also had a, a small dog training course. So we had some dog trainers that were learning how to train, and they would also help with the dogs within the facility. We had a, ran a ranch down in Del Zura, California, which is pretty much right next to the border down south. The nonprofit did not survive the pandemic. The overhead was roughly 12000 per month. And so mm -hmm. during the pandemic, people were not willing to continue to support it. And so it, it shut down shortly, I, I think maybe three or four months after the pandemic. And at that point, that's when I decided that I wanted to create a dog training course. And so I put together a basic obedience course and an advanced obedience course, and I was selling them online. And it was doing okay. The first month I released it had the most sales, but the sales just continued to go down month after month. And at that point I decided, you know what, let's give this YouTube thing a shot. I already have about 75 videos. You gave so in. So I know I, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I always wanted to do YouTube. I was yeah. always interested and fascinated by YouTube and I thought I could do it and I thought I would be successful, but there's always something that holds people back from doing it. And finally I just decided, well, I have the videos, I have the content, so I at least have about a half a year of episodes if I'm posting two a week. Uh. 
right? Yeah, I so suppose that made a super nice little nice little introduction into YouTube. Hold on, I've already done all the videos that are gonna like that's really yep, cool. Yep. That's nice. actually something I've told a few people that have been interested in in doing YouTube. I would tell yeah. them make get, you know get a 50 stop to pile. 100. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Because what happens to a lot of people is they start posting and they don't get the the views that they want, the responses yeah. that they want. So they become demotivated and they quit. But everybody who starts a channel when they first start out, they're going to be posting for a good amount of time and not getting that many views. And some yeah. people that just demotivates them and they give up. And I've seen it happen with friends who seen what I was doing and they want to start their channel, whether it was another dog channel or uh, one of my friends started a cooking channel, but they just don't keep up with it. And so the yeah. channel doesn't grow and you have to keep doing it in order for it to grow. And so mine didn't even become uh, monetized. I think it took about eight months before it became monetized, six to eight months. And I was posting two videos every single week. And I already had a decent following on social media from doing the show on animal planet and it still took that long to really mm -hmm. get it going every video i would post you know 12 views 15 views one would get 20 and i'm like awesome that was a good video <laughs> success 20 views <laughs> yeah, nice. since i had the backlog i was good to just keep posting yeah. it. and i knew that the the information was good because as i said I, I had the chance to learn from some of the best in the industry and i knew these techniques were effective and if I could break them down in a way that would be easy for people to understand and implement, it would eventually catch on. And so it started to do that. It's still, you know, in comparison to some people's platforms, I'm still considered very, very small. You know, when you look at some people that have 20 million subscribers, it's like, that's amazing. Incredible. You'll get there. Energy. You'll get there. Yeah. <laughs> but I think I've been talking way too much about myself already. I'm curious. What got it's fine. You I'll just edit it all out. It's fine. Don't worry Perfect. about it. <laughs> what, what got you into wanting to do uh, truffle detection or searching out truffles? I know it's it's an interesting thing to look at since it's one of those delicacies that we've never been able to um, domesticate, right? We can't grow it on our own. So using dogs and pigs, I believe as well, to find them has been the primary approach. So do you have a passion for truffles or is it just something fun you wanted to do with your dog while also doing something yeah, I, pretty cool? I think like you, I was always the one growing up, uh, going to people's houses or our house. We've always had dogs and I would I would just be playing with the dogs. You know, I've always had an affinity for dogs as well. I was also had an affinity for, uh, you know, good food, you know, always loved good food. And ever since... Um, a kid i remember just flicking through this big mushroom book on our shelf at home like oh, i must have been five years old six years old my dad happened to have a roger phillips uh mushrooms book he's like uh, the late roger phillips he's uh, no longer with us but he's like one of the godfathers of mushrooms mm. and um i think looking back that's one of my earliest memories is constantly flicking through that and you know laughing and joking at the mushrooms that you know were shaped like penises or something like that you know but so i've always been fascinated by mushrooms um and without even realizing it that obsession just grew and grew and grew um i got distracted in my 20s because i thought oh you know i'm going to go and build a business i'm going to be a digital marketer start an online business and you know um in 2020 that that all came crashing down for me a little bit and then i was like oh i i can sort of stop for a second pause and what is important so that's when my success definition sort of changed it wasn't money in the bank it was sort of like right my partner danny roof over our heads and my biggest goal at that point was to get a dog and we were always waiting until we could move out of london because we were just in a flat we didn't really have a garden and didn't really want to uh, get a dog because i knew i wanted a decent sized dog as well so when the covid hit it was not only a great excuse to uh review my sort of approach towards uh, success and what i'm doing in my life but also great excuse to finally get out of London. And now we're sort of in a, in a house in the sort of nice cozy suburbs. And uh, then we got the dog. So as soon as I knew that was going to happen, I was like, well, the logical thing here for me is to get a dog and train it to hunt truffles. Cause that's like just merging my two biggest passions in life. And that is basically the journey that I'm on right now. And that's why, um, you know, truffle forager has come about. And I thought, well, unlike you, I'm, I hadn't done all those years of like expert training in the dogs in the dog world. And I don't have all that years 
um, professional training behind me. I've, you know, I've got amateur level and what I've learned from Caesar Milan and reading other books and, you know, that journey has changed over time. Um, but what I have is passion and enthusiasm. So I thought, I'm just going to document the whole journey and just stick that online. And, you know, of course, in the future, once you've got an audience, that potentially could be something I can just have as a full time, full time gig. So that's the reason for it. That's why it's come about. But also, you know, in that whole journey, uh, there was a whole mental health thing as well that came along with it, you know, because my mental health went like a roller coaster and then it went off the roller coaster for a, quite a while. And so I think there's something in being out in nature, being with a dog, foraging, looking down on the ground, looking for mushrooms, being with your dog, hunting for truffles, coming back home and, you know, cooking up an amazing dish and and uh, either just sharing it with myself, sharing it with my family, uh, or what I'm doing is, is sharing it with the world through video. So I, I, anyway, it's, it's doing some of that stuff has really helped ground me a lot. So there's a, there's a whole backbone of like, you know, just getting outdoors in nature and uh, mm -hmm. doing, doing this, you know, this is my little, my little piece and my little contribution. So um, yeah, sorry, I might have got distracted from what you asked me initially, but. No, that's, that's great. It. And that, there is something very peaceful about walking through nature with your dog. I mean, it's kind of the way that we've evolved with dogs. You think of hunter gatherers before the yeah. agricultural revolution. And, and uh, you know, even during that period of time, it wasn't a quick transition. It was a very slow transition. If you ever read the book Sapiens, he goes into detail on in how that happened. But dogs essentially evolved with us and that we are part of their natural environment, which is really cool and how they learned over the years to really read our micro expressions as well. Yeah, so yeah. often dogs can figure out what we're going to do before we even know we're going to do it because they're so in tune to us. Now getting into scent detection, were you also fascinated by other aspects of dog training? Like did obedience interest you? Did protection work or search and rescue or tracking or any other sort of scent detection aspects of dog training fascinate you at all? So yeah i think i think well interestingly the thing that i focused on with buddy um from being i mean as a truffle hunter and you know that people are always looking for like the things to do straight away and send train your dog from like you know the get-go rub truffle oil on the teats of the 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 bitch and and so that the, the pup can lick mm -hmm. it and smell it and you know get that connection early on and i'm sure all that is good but I didn't really go hardcore into doing scent stuff for a while. All, all I was really primarily focused on doing, especially even more so during the pandemic and everyone's worried about dogs not being able to get socialized. I just wanted to create the most confident dog that I possibly could. So everything that I was doing was just geared towards doing that. So yeah, I did a lot of obedience. But interestingly, I got to a certain stage, you know, and I was out in the garden, like, you know, you know, I'd watch one of your videos and I'd go and do it. And then very quickly, you know, we've got like a nine, 10 week old puppy and he's like doing a hell of a lot of stuff that is like quite impressive. You know, I'm pre impressing my friends when they come round. And to be fair, that might have been a, a downfall a little bit later on because because he got so good so quickly. I, I also got then a little bit complacent, you know, and when we went out mm. on, you know, we probably opened him up to going off the lead perhaps too soon um, and all these sorts of things. But because his recall was like, dynamite i didn't even worry about it but over time now in his later teens there were some other things that that started to develop so um but then yeah i started bringing in some of the scent stuff um and then always playing games with him scent games and from straight away it was really exciting i knew i had a future truffle dog champion on my hands because his nose and the noise it makes when he's trying to find treats around the around the house was just like a a, a hoover you know, an absolute hoover. So uh, I thought, you know, watch a few more of your videos, re do some reading online and then put it into practice. And um, that was another one of my goals, actually, that actually nearly came true just before Christmas. Um, in in this podcast, I've interviewed, obviously, a lot of truffle hunters. And um, I was speaking to Melissa, who's the second lady who I interviewed. And in getting doggy, uh, doggy, in getting buddy, uh, the prep, I was preparing to... Um, I was Googling like truffle dog competition and I thought, oh, there's got to be a truffle dog competition. There are in other countries. And there was one in the UK about 15 years ago, because if there was one in the UK, I thought, well, that's an ambition to to reach is get my dog trained up to to win that. And wouldn't that be great? 
and unfortunately there wasn't one in the UK. So um, I joked with some of these podcast guests I had on about year 18 months ago that, you know, that's one of the things that I wanted to do. And um, it went quiet. And then Melissa came back to me last summer and said, hey, Ben, do you want to do you want to do this? Do you want to do a truffle dog competition? Uh, and uh, I said yes. And then um, with about five months, maybe four and a half months of planning, we put on, I said, let's not just do a truffle dog competition. Let's turn it into a truffle festival. So uh, the UK hasn't had or doesn't have a truffle festival. Other countries that are more into truffles like Italy, France, you know, they have multiple festivals, but we don't. So at the end of November last year, we, we sold out and we had 500 people come to a, the, the first ever UK truffle festival and truffle dog championships which was uh, which was epic and uh, I haven't really spoken about it uh, much but um but the annoying thing was which was quite funny the the closer we got to the competition I actually thought I can't actually fairly compete buddy in this in this thing because I'm too closely involved I'm too closely related to the judges I'm probably going to be the one setting up the arena with the judges so it just wouldn't be fair but um with about 3 weeks to go before the before the competition actually happened um and we got some sent training trial judges to come in and you know raise the standards a little bit um so it wasn't just you know you know my mum officiating some dogs it's got some credibility hopefully next year will be bigger and better but um what was i going to say we we got re- we reached we got reached out to by a japanese tv crew um which i've looked it up since and it's it's up by viewership i think it's the second most popular japanese tv program in their country and it's like a the the focal point of it is a a, a guy he's a comic a famous japanese comedian and he goes around the, the world and competes in these sort of obscure like competitions and festivals and things like that he's done a he's done a porcini uh, mushroom hunt in italy somewhere a competition he's done a waiter competition somewhere anyway so they wanted to compete in our dog competition i'm thinking is this real i actually ignored the first two or three emails because it's not every day you get emailed by a Japanese TV crew asking to compete in your dog competition. I thought someone had gone gone a bit bananas. But anyway, it transpired that it was legit and they obviously needed a dog. And because I'd just basically given up with my hopes of um getting Buddy to do it. And I ended up saying, well you can have you can have Buddy. So uh he came he came he did he trained with this guy. I had about three, four hours to like show this guy the ropes and um he spoke broken English and he ended up coming fourth place out of about 15 dogs in our, uh, we had two categories and it was the lower down category in terms of difficulty, but I was very impressed. Sorry, I got a lot of words in there. I think I just got a bit excited to bring it, bring it up again. But um, yeah, that no, was that's cool. Awesome. And you, you have a Fox Red British lab? Crossed with a Vizsla, yeah so uh oh, okay right on yeah i was watching a couple of your videos so i saw your lab it looks very very comparable to my lab and yeah a fox yeah red british lab yours does seem a little bit lighter on the red but i was assuming it was probably within that same area though yeah he's he's stunning and so so he's, um i've forgotten the names of your dogs but um R R is the uh, uh malinois. malinois um and what's the what's the red lab Char- charlie charlie yeah Ari and Amazing. Charlie, yeah you know, so uh, just talking about dog training in general, when I was first getting into dog training, my primary focus was obedience. I wanted to be a yeah. really good obedience trainer. But then as I continued to learn more about dog training, I started to realize how the more you can understand in different fields within dog training, the more you become proficient and better and reaching that point of uh, mastery of your own field within dog training. And it was something that a lot of students would ask when they would come down to the Tom Rose School when I was an assistant instructor there. You know, their main focus would probably be most of the time people that go to dog training schools, they care about the obedience because that's going to be the bread and butter if they have a dog training facility. Most people just want their dog to sit, come, lay down. Basic obedience, right? Well, when they would ask about that, I would let them know the more you can understand. So when you start doing scent detection or you start doing protection, search and rescue, tracking, all these additional things outside of your basic obedience, you get a deeper understanding of how dogs learn and how they process information. And a lot Mm -hmm. of this stuff becomes very transferable. And even something when we're looking at scent detection, there's different ways of doing scent detection. So the way that you might train a dog to detect truffles 
mm. is going to be different than how you teach a dog to do tracking or how you teach them to do search and rescue. And it's interesting because you start to look and you think, well, okay, we know that everything that our dogs do is based on motivation, whether it's motivation to access something pleasant, motivation to prevent something unpleasant, or the behavior itself is fun. Now with scent detection, especially people that learn how to get their reliability in the beginning with training by using positive punishment, which there's nothing wrong with positive punishment when we use it the correct way when we're looking at the four quadrants of opera conditioning if we want reliability and obedience because go ahead you're going to say something i was i was just going to say for the listener and i probably need a reminder as well describe to us what what positive you mean by positive punishment yeah so that's going to be the four quadrants of opera conditioning when we start training a dog and we do some of the engagement training or we're doing what a lot of trainers call charging the markers and that's just a sound that predicts either a reward or punishment if we have a sound that predicts any of the four quadrants of opera conditioning, by definition, it's a marker. Now, once a dog is classically conditioned to a sound, and that comes from the studies that were conducted by Ivan Pavlov, you would have a tone that would go off prior to the food being delivered to the dogs. After a certain amount of repetitions, when the dogs heard the tone or the sound, they would begin to salivate before the food was present. Now, once they become classically conditioned, then we move into opera conditioning. And opera conditioning is a dog that understands that their behavior has an effect on their environment. This is how we can get dogs to do all kinds of different tasks if they believe they're the ones controlling their environment. So they know how to make good things happen, and they know how to make bad things happen. And so they avoid the things that make bad things happen that they don't like, and they continue to repeat the things that make good things happen, simply put. Now, the four quadrants is positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, positive punishment, negative punishment. Now, this terminology does confuse a lot of people, but once you know how it works, then it becomes very easy to understand and remember. We don't want to think of positive as good and negative as bad. That's the first thing that confuses people because they hear mm -hmm. positive and they hear punishment. And they go, how can a punishment be positive? I don't understand. So positive is adding, whereas negative is taking away. Reinforcement is encouraging the repeat of a behavior, and punishment is preventing the repeat of a behavior. So once we know that, we know positive mm. reinforcement is anything we add to the equation to reinforce the repeat of a behavior. So good boy, you give him a treat, you pet him, anything like that. Negative reinforcement, and the reason why it's called negative is because we turn some sort of pressure on, and that requires an action on the dog's part or human, whatever, you can use this on people too. And then once they comply, the pressure is turned off. So when we use it in dog training, usually we use it with leash pressure training. So dogs have that classical opposition reflex. You pull on the leash, they resist, they pull the other way. We teach them to go with the pressure on the leash. So they follow the leash, turning off the pressure, therefore we're implementing negative reinforcement. There's multiple ways we can do that though. People often do it with their own dogs. They will take their dog and they want their dog to sit, so they push down on their dog's butt. The moment the dog goes down into a sit, they remove their hand, therefore they just implement a negative reinforcement. They were reinforcing the sit behavior and they applied pressure and when the dog complied, they removed their hand. When a yeah. dog sits, nobody keeps pushing on the dog's butt. They automatically remove it because the dog's complying. Negative punishment is when we take anything of value away from a dog. So if you are petting your dog, this is one of the best examples. You're petting your dog and your dog jumps up at you and you stop petting your dog. The removal of the pet would be implementing negative punishment. And then positive punishment is anything we add to the equation to stop a behavior. Whether And it doesn't always have to be physical. When people first start learning dog training, they think it has to be physical. It doesn't. Anything that you add that the dog doesn't like is positive punishment. So if a certain behavior predicts the addition of something a dog doesn't like, then they don't repeat that behavior. Like a good example, and this is why I often try my best to teach the science of dog training, as you already know, because yeah. if I can get somebody to understand the science, then they can problem solve, they can figure out solutions to different situations, and they can really start to master the art. But let's say we have a water hose, and you're trying to prevent a dog from going into the flower garden, right? Well, if your dog enjoys the water hose, this is not going to be a very effective technique because yeah. the dog's going to continue to go into the flower bed in order for you to spray him with the hose because to that dog, it's fun. But another dog hates the water hose. And so for that dog, it's going to work. 
So positive punishment, anything we add. Now, usually and traditionally within dog training, that's going to be something like a leash pop on a training collar, prong collar, uh, remote collar, whatever it is. So going back to what we were talking about earlier, some people that start off, so if we look at traditional style dog training, that's going to be your, uh, what a lot of people would call like your yank and crank, right? You can get a dog to do just about anything with enough force when it comes to obedience. Not saying that's a good thing. So I, I will use positive punishment in my training, but I have certain rules that I follow in order to add positive punishment. One, the dog has to know what I'm asking them to do. They have to have a high success rate. They have to be generalized, meaning they understand the behavior in multiple different environments. They have to know how to turn off pressure by complying, and I have to have given them a very clear path to success. So when they do receive a correction, they adjust very quickly. So something I often tell people, if you are going to add corrections within your training, if you're having to do a lot of corrections, then you did not do the training correctly. Because mm. if we do the training correctly in the beginning, if the dog really knows what their responsibilities are as far as obedience goes, once we add corrections, they should go, oh, okay, and then they don't do that anymore. And that's a clear indicator that we've done the training the right way. You add a couple corrections, and now your dog's perfect. And usually it's funny when you work with someone who's only been doing positive obedience for a long time, and they're not getting the reliability that they want, and you show up as a trainer – and you see where the dog's at, you realize that they've done that training, and you add a correction, and all of a sudden the dog's perfect, and the owner goes, unbelievable. That's all I had to do, and my dog would have behaved perfectly. It's like, yeah, you laid the foundation. You did it right. Now mm -hmm. we can add it. Now, traditional style dog training, they would start with positive punishment. They would literally correct the dog into all the different positions. So instead of teaching the dog how to get into a position by providing a physical cue, they would correct the dog mm -hmm. into the position. And you would end up having very fast results. You could train a dog very, very quickly doing that technique, but they're not going to enjoy it. So they may do the down when you ask them to, but when they're going into the down, they're doing it to avoid a correction. Whereas the dog that was trained the right way, foundation being positive reinforcement, that dog's going into the down for the hope and the possibility of getting a treat. Both are doing the behaviors. Both are influenced by different motivating factors. What's really cool about making somebody who wants to be a well-rounded dog trainer do scent detection work, you can't really correct a dog to do scent detection work. If you add positive punishment in scent detection training, what you find is you get a dog that lies. They will start offering up behaviors of indication or if you're doing something like a competitive track that you see in Schutzen obedience, uh, IGP, which IGP is a competition obedience. Most people know it as Schutzen um, and it's broken down into three parts, obedience, tracking, and protection. And tracking, the dogs have to track and they have to do certain amount of turns. They have to indicate on articles. And if you make a dog do the tracking obedience with corrections, what you find is they lie. They will pretend like they're, they're tracking and they're not. They'll go right past the turn and they'll continue to act like they're tracking. So it doesn't lend itself very well in the world of scent detection. Mm. So it's one of the things that I recommend to people, like if you find yourself using a lot of corrections, start doing some scent detection training because you have to be really good at reading the dog. You have to be really good at your timing. You have to really understand motivation and how it applies to getting a dog to do a behavior, which if you're doing something like, I haven't done truffle detection. What I've done is uh, cadaver searches. I've done bomb detection, narcotic detection, tracking and search and rescue. So that's where my experience in the scent detection world comes. But I'm pretty sure that teaching truffle detection is going to be pretty comparable to cadaver or bomb detection, what, things like that. Sorry, I'm showing my naivety. What's ca cadaver? Oh, cadaver is going to be um, like if you're searching for a dead body, like during 9-11 when they had the dogs going in looking for uh, people. So they have scent kits where they will, they will send you a kit. It's pretty expensive, but you have all these different odors at different levels of the decomposition process. Oh wow! And so you can teach the dog all the different levels of of the decomposition now. So they're they're distinguishing dog... between 
alive hu living human beings and and dead human beings yep, and exactly different right. states wow well. absolutely now when a dog at least from my experience and i'm curious to see how it is if it's different at all with truffle detection but the dog's not finding the cadaver because finding the cadaver is fun they're not they're not indicating to cocaine because they want cocaine they're indicating because indicating to a cadaver or cocaine or bomb detection is a prediction of something the dog enjoys usually tug or a treat or something like that what's really fun about search and rescue if you haven't done search and rescue which i find interesting is the motivation for search and rescue is usually different than some of the other ones the act of search and rescue for dogs that train search and rescue a lot of times the act of doing search and rescue is fun like because it, it's search based in like hide and hide and seek is that is that the type of yeah. thing it's like oh i yeah, found my yep. human being i found my owner or some other yeah, human yeah. being and now i've done search and rescue with dogs where we would call it a felon search instead of search and rescue because these dogs would prefer to bite so with those dogs, the person that would run off would have either, you know, a, a bite sleeve or something like yeah. that for when once the dog finds them, you can present a bite. Now the dog's biting. So for that dog, the motivation is to bite, which people that don't do protection training, they don't realize how much dogs love protection work. And a really mm -hmm. clear indicator of that is if we look at some of the best protection trainers out there. When they're doing their obedience, now we talked about markers earlier as a marker, and I know you use markers, I watched it in your videos. When we have a marker that predicts release and reward, that's known as a terminal marker, at least that's the terminology that most people use, and it guarantees release and reward. So if we say, you know, a lot of people use yes, I use the word free, that often confuses people because they think of the dictionary definition of free, right? And I'm like, well, for the dogs I train, that means release plus reward. But what a lot of uh, advanced protection trainers will teach their dog is they will teach their dog essentially three terminal markers. So they'll have one terminal marker that says, you're correct, you're released, come to me to get your reward. Whether we're going to play tug or I'm going to give you a treat. Then they have a terminal marker that says, go and get your toy. Maybe I have a toy sitting on the ground. Maybe I have a treat or something like that for the dog. So I can have the dog focus on me. Maybe if I'm working on a little bit of precision obedience, then I can release the dog and the dog can take off and go get the reward. Then they have another terminal marker to go bite the decoy. Now the reason why they do that is because when you use a terminal marker, what you're going to find if you only have one is if there's multiple reward options for the dog, they're going to choose what they prefer most. And almost all of these dogs will want the decoy more than anything. So if you're trying to work obedience, but you're also trying to do it with the distraction of a decoy, the highest level of impulse control, and you use your terminal marker and you want your dog to come to you to get the treat, and the dog goes, you just used your terminal marker, I'm going to the decoy. And so what they found was because of that, they started creating these other markers to show the dog, I'm releasing and rewarding you, but I'm not saying to go bite the decoy. You're going to come to me to get the treat. And so then the dog would have to learn that, and that would actually be a process. So it shows you that the dog actually wants to bite. I, I've just seen articles before where – I remember this one article I saw. It showed a dog jumping up for a bite, and it was talking about animal cruelty and that these trainers were being cruel, cruel to the dogs. And those people have no idea how that is those dogs. And usually it's going to be your breeds, right? Like your Malinois, your Dutch Shepherds, German Shepherds, things like that. Just like... They love it. Yeah, and just like Labradors love doing uh, hunting type work. They love search and rescue. The dog I trained for search and rescue was a golden retriever. And it was his favorite thing. He absolutely loved it. So I was the first in my class to pass search and rescue by complete accident. I didn't realize that I was training my golden retriever on search and rescue before I started officially doing search and rescue because what you said earlier, hide and seek, right? Mm, yeah, yeah. I was playing hide and seek with my golden retriever, not even knowing that I was teaching him search and rescue. What I would do is he loved fetch, right? Retrievers love fetch. And so I had to chuck it and I would throw the ball. And this was a really big open field that I was doing this at and no one around for miles. So it was perfect. And I would throw the ball, and then I would take off the other direction. And he would always end up finding me, whether I'm hiding behind a tree or something like that. And then I, I started to up it to make it more difficult. I started climbing in trees. 
And I would watch him as he's running around and he would always find me. So then once I started doing the search and rescue work with him, he picked it up really, really fast. But sorry, to go back to the original point, that's one of the things I love about scent work though, is it really makes you use different strategies and approaches to trigger the right motivating factors to get our dogs to do the behaviors. And that's really, I mean, anytime we're looking at dog training, that's what we're doing. We're trying to figure out what sort of motivational factor can I present to this dog to get them to do something. And that's what a lot of people struggle with when they're doing something like obedience and they start taking their dog to new environments and they're wondering why their dog isn't listening anymore. And I'm sure you heard it before. My dog does it perfectly well inside the house, whether it's starting to work on indicating scent detection or obedience, but then we take it to a new environment and there's all kinds of different distractions. Well, all those distractions are essentially different motivating factors that we as the trainers are competing with to influence the dog's behavior. So with trouble detection, do you find that the dog enjoys the search to get the reward or does your dog mm. enjoy the act of searching, which some dogs do? So it's a, it's a really good question. And um, part of the mission I'm on is to, because I, I feel like there's, there's, there's two spectrums of truffle dog training out there or scent training out there. There's, you've got the, you know, the, old, the, the 70 year old Italians who have been training their dogs for 30 years in the woods, probably, you know, just would hand, hand me down and, the way that they do it is probably completely different to the way that someone like yourself might approach doing it as well from sort of the, you know, traditional scent based training. And, and I'm hoping over time to sort of merge those two fields into one, but um, with regards to, well, for buddy, for example, I, I always thought the best way to go about it, especially because I didn't have loads of truffles on hand um, was yeah. to focus on getting him ball obsessed and he is definitely ball obsessed um and get to go with it that way and so that he knows that a ball is coming um well actually i'm using treats a lot because it's not practical to either do training or even go truffle hunting for real and every time he finds one or finds a bait to like deal with a ball um so i'm mixing it up but um then some but so he's using a ball and that's the way that I'm still going to focus is to primarily the ball or high value treats is going to be the the focus for him. But having said that, he's partial to a truffle. Um, you know, he's, he would he would eat one. And some of the truffle hunters that I, you know, one of the issues is, you know, you teach your dog to go and find truffles and then they're digging for the truffles. And if you're not there on time or you're not you're not watching them, you know, nine times out of ten, that truffle might disappear if the dog has a taste for it. And um, I was invited out for a long weekend to go proper like white truffle hunting in, in Europe by a, a, a good friend who's a, who's a professional truffle hunter, the whole family truffle hunts. They've got truff 12 truffle dogs. Um, and it's interesting. Like one of the things that they talk about is, you know, they don't necessarily focus on getting the dog to have drive with regards to a ball but they early on, they do things to encourage the dog to actually, you know, get drive towards the taste of a truffle. So um, and then then in the real world, it then becomes um, more of a case of being able to watch your dog and make sure you can get there to stop them in time. But I think with the what's interesting about truffles is um, depending on what species you're going for, they grow at different depths. So, for example, the most highly prized truffle, the, the tuber magnatum, the white truffle, the Italian white truffle, alba truffle, the one that fetches the big bucks. And I can now from experience say it, you know, rightly so. It smells the best. It tastes the best. It's amazing. Um, and that one definitely can't be cultivated and you definitely need dogs. Um, although they have proven it in France that in a small scale, they have actually cultivated it. Uh, so interesting times to come. But um the fact that that one grows deeper down, it, you know, that the truffle hunter has a lot more time uh, to, mm. to get there if their dog is digging for it. And actually, they do need a dog to dig for it because, you know, um, just to help them show where it is and things like that. So I don't know is the answer. Um, I, I would be really interested to hear your take on it. Like if you were to go out tomorrow and create a, a beginner's guide to truffle dog training, how would you do it? Would you focus on what I've done similarly, um, 
Yeah. Yeah, I think it would be comparable. And I think over time, because when we are doing something like finding an odor that the odor itself might not be a reward, but in this case, if the dog's eating the truffles, then it could be, of course. And when you started doing your scent detection work with Buddy, did you start when he was a puppy or was he a little bit older? Yeah, he was a, he was a, well, it depends what you mean. I mean, we played find it games from straight away, you know, little treats around the, around the lounge. Uh, so you, you started know, just, him at eight, nine weeks of age or a little bit later? Because of course, puppy goes up to usually about a year. Oh, yeah. Take. Now, I an think, interesting thing is, yeah. sorry, go ahead. No, no. I, well, we were playing those small, friendly, fun little games very, very early on, um, mainly to stop ourselves getting puppy bitten. <laughs> Here, go, mm. go find this treat. Um, it, we found that as a really good way to distract him, and he loved it. Um, but then I got a bit more like odor, odor scent training, which came much further down the, the line. But you did some foundation work in the beginning. Yeah. That's what I was yeah. going at. And that's great. Yeah, yeah. And that's something that anyone who's interested in becoming very proficient with their dog and having a dog that is exceptional, whether it's dock diving, protection, truffle work, or any other aspect of dog training is to start when they're young. So if we can take a puppy between eight to 16 weeks during that imprinting stage, and we can get the dog to love an activity then that dog's going to be significantly easier to train when they're older so yeah. with ari and charlie for example if you watch any video when i'm training them they're always super excited and happy to be training because i made training a game i made it one of the most enjoyable activities for them and of course play is one of the most important things we can do with the dog i i can never uh, stress that enough for people if they're like what should mm. i be doing with my dog you should be playing with your dog it's one of the yeah. best ways to create a strong bond and if your dog enjoys playing with you they're going to enjoy training with you if they enjoy training with you then teaching them new things becomes much easier instead of the dog that easily becomes distracted and starts mm -hmm. walking away and the person's like hey i'm trying to work with you but my goal if i was to start a brand new dog i would want to start when they're a puppy and those first eight weeks, my goal is going to be building that food drive, building that toy drive, and then building the desire for scent work. So I would be trying to do some introduction type work for scent training, which for me, if I'm, if I'm introducing a dog to scent work, I'm not going to necessarily have them putting their head into boxes or cinder blocks or uh, PVC pipes in the very, very beginning when they're a puppy. I'm going to be linking the odor up with their toy, creating that strong positive association. I'm probably going to be doing some field searches. So for people that don't know what a field search is, all it really is, it's taking a toy that the dog loves. So we know the dog is trying to find the toy. That's the motivation. And then we're throwing the toy, playing fetch really in the very beginning. With a young puppy, I will race them to the toy. So if I'm playing with a nine week old puppy, I'm gonna take the toy, I'm gonna move it around, I'm gonna throw it, and then I'm gonna race the puppy to the toy. By doing that, it creates more drive. Which is kind of funny that, you know, a lot of people that aren't professional trainers often don't really know how to play with their dogs. They think it's just throwing is the only thing we have to do. And to put in perspective, I was doing a, a promo for a company called BarkBox. I'm not sure if you're familiar, but they send out toys every month. They're really cool little packages of goodies for dogs, and it's like a subscription service. But they sent me a bunch of them. I had about eight boxes, and I used two of them for the, the filming that we did. So I had the other six boxes, and I went to a local park, and I was giving them away. And I said, if you want, you can have this box. Just let me film your dog playing with the toys, because then I could potentially use that footage later. And pretty much every single person, I had to play with their dog. Because their dog, like they would throw it and the dog would run at it, but then now the toy is no longer active and the dog goes, yeah. okay, well, that's no fun. And so I found myself playing with all these dogs in order to get that footage that I want. But the point that I'm making is we have to be engaged with the dog. Yeah. We have to play with the dog. It's not like supervising their play. That doesn't work. We don't throw a toy and supervise their play. We throw the toy and we play with them. So that's what I do. I run with the dog. I try to beat him, but I always let the dog win. But I get so close to where I'm about to win. But then, oh, the puppy gets it. Whoa, that's impressive that you did that, mm -hmm. right, buddy? And he gets excited. And then we continue to play. And I'm always building that drive. 
Then as they start to get a little bit older and their confidence becomes a little bit better, now I'm going to start doing more of those field searches where I'm throwing it farther and farther. And then eventually I'm throwing it and I'm spinning them so they see where it goes. And this kind of goes in line with some of the first few steps that we do at search and rescue training where, you know, if we were teaching your dog search and rescue, I would hold your dog by a harness or an agitation collar, something where he can pull and get excited. You would tease him with a toy. You would take off, run maybe 25 yards and hide behind a tree. Well, your dog watched you go behind the tree. Your dog knows where you are. So when I release, your dog's going to run to where he last saw your position, and then he's instinctively going to use his nose. And then gradually we start adding more distance. It's the same thing when we start doing those field searches. So we'll throw the toy. A lot of times, if the dog can handle running a far distance, maybe not a nine, 10 week old puppy, but when they're a little bit older, we can use a chuck it, throw it out into a field with tall grass, as long as there's no dangerous wild animals in the area like rattlesnakes or something, have the dog look and then spin the dog and send them. And what they're going to do, they're going to run to where they think they saw it, and then they're going to naturally start using their nose. They're going to pick up that scent cone, mm -hmm. and it's really cool when you see it, when they grab that scent cone and they make that beeline straight to the, the item. So that's how I start. Then when I do start introducing the dog to, you know, whether like a lot of times I'll use cinder blocks or like PVC pipes or something like that where you can put the odor and you can have the dog start searching for it. I always try to make that as fun as possible. So I get excited when I'm training the dog and I like to use a toy that I only use during scent work. So the goal is to get the dog to enjoy finding the toy, but at the same time, we build a passion and a love for the activity because the activity predicts what the dog likes. So then the dog does end up enjoying the activity. The act of doing it, doing the work becomes fun. So, mm. you know, you probably see it with your dog. You start getting out his equipment, his collar, whatever you use for when you're doing the training. He sees that. He starts recognizing these things, and he becomes excited because dogs do pick up on very subtle things that we might do. It could be something as simple as, you know, grabbing your keys or whatever. Your dog sees that and goes, oh, we're getting ready to do this training. So I think if we do it the right way, the dog develops a love for the activity, but then really what we're doing is we're using the toy to build that drive, that motivation, that desire to do the work. I do think it's kind of funny. I never thought about the dogs actually eating the truffles, but that <laughs> does make sense. Yeah. And I could see how that would be a problem. So do you want to have a toy that the dog sees as a higher value reward than the truffle itself? Or do you have a treat or cheese or something that your dog prefers over the truffle? So then when you prevent your dog from getting the truffle, you still give them something like, hey, you can't have that, but this, remember, you like this more. How does that work? <laughs> I think there's probably differing opinions, and I don't have enough experience to, I mean, I know what I'm going to go with, but I think there might be real, you know, traditional truffle hunters who are probably like, no, no, uh, I like that my dog wants to eat the truffles, because that means they're going to look harder for the truffles and find them. But um no, when you're when you're talking there, you made me think of a cause, so a question for myself. So, Buddy is high, the highest drive is is a tennis ball, no doubt. But I haven't made that exclusive for truffle dog training, and I'm wondering maybe I should maybe I should just reserve that for when I'm doing either truffle dog training or we're out going and doing a, an actual proper proper hunt, um, and because I use the tennis ball as almost a safety net you know if, if he's off the lead i know if anything goes wrong or there's another distraction mm. i know i've got the ball in my back pocket so it's fine um 99 times out of 100 anyway so, but maybe i should not use the tennis ball as much um in the day-to-day -day. what do you think it does build more desire for it so the first dog that i was doing scent detection work when i would pull out that it was a chuck it ball for her when I would pull that ball out, I mean, she knew what we were doing and she would get really excited about it. Now, for you, if you're using it to help reinforce a recall, if you need to, I would still have that. You know what I mean? I would still have that as backup in case you need to call them to you and you want that high value reward. But I think if you were to limit it to your truffle work, I think yeah. it would have a, a great impact. And what I would do, I mean, you know, often we... we might feel silly in the beginning when we start first start working with dogs and we're doing a bunch of goofy movements and stuff 
but when I would do the scent work, if I was still on the stage where I'm using the PVC pipe or the cinder blocks or something like that, I would start with the dog on a climb platform, so an elevated bed. I would put him on there as I'm getting prepped, but then once I bring the ball out, I want the dog at the edge of the bed, excited, jumping up and down, wanting to start the training. And what I would always do is, you know, they they often will um, replicate our enthusiasm. This is why they say that a dog is a direct reflection of their owner, because they do imitate us in a sense. So what I do is I pull the ball out, and then I start getting, I'm like, oh, are you ready? Oh, oh, right. You start making these excited yeah. sounds and it feels silly and kind of weird, but it does have an impact. As we start doing that, they start to get more excited. So now we're amping up the excitement of the game, which as we know, releases more uh, dopamine. So the dopamine is released often before the dog gets the reward. So building up the anticipation for the reward builds more drive and desire to do the activity. They've seen that in dogs when we mark a behavior, for example. When we use the, the marker that lets them know they're going to receive a reward, the moment we mark is when the dopamine starts to flood their system. It's not when they get the reward. It's when they know that the reward is around the corner. So I try to build that drive and produce as much excitement and dopamine to the activity that I can, so then the dog loves doing it. And you can see in the short little protect, or not protection, I'm sorry, the short little scent detection series that I have on my channel, I think it's like four episodes or something like that, Ari is super excited to do it because yeah. of those concepts that I like to implement. Now, what you're saying earlier is some people would disagree with certain strategies and techniques. What I always say is, you know, there's a dozen ways to skin a cat, right? There's all kinds of different ways of doing something. And that's something, you know, when I was saying, I, I like to get people to understand the science. So, for example, if we're trying to teach our dog something, if you can present any sort of physical cue that guarantees that the dog will do the behavior, then we can put it on a command. It really doesn't matter what it is. And that's really simplifying dog training. But if I want a dog to do bite work and I want the dog to target the bicep of the decoy, well, okay. I have to build a drive for the dog to want to bite. And then how do I get the dog to target that very specific area? Easy. I put the dog on a back tie. We know that dogs are going to bite whatever's closest to them. So then all I do is I feed the target area to the dog and I build the drive for that target area and I do it over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. If I want a dog to find a specific odor, well, we have to build the drive for it we have to build a positive association. Then we have to start showing the dog that when they find the odor, there's added value to them. And that's of course, when we start teaching the indication. And what's, what's funny, when I first was learning how to teach a dog an indication, now I disagree with, this was more of a traditional style person that was teaching me. He said, when the dog gets to the odor, when you wanna start teaching the indication to give a little leash pop and correct the dog into a sit. and looking at it now well the mm. dog sees that as any version of punishment you're literally punishing the dog for getting to the odor we know that dogs learn through patterns so teaching an indication once we realize that because dogs can put together an entire sequence it's very simple whatever comes first will predict what comes next and the dogs can learn those patterns so if the dog gets to the odor and I want the dog to lay down before I reward them. Then when the dog gets to the odor, I make sure I have a good strong down on verbal command. I tell the dog down, they lay down, I use my terminal marker and I reward them. After enough of those, it becomes a predictable pattern. The dog gets to the odor. The dog goes, every time I smell this odor, you tell me to down. I lay down, you use the terminal marker, the sound I love that kicks off that dopamine surge. And I run to you and I get my reward. Beautiful. So now mm. the dog is going to start getting the same dopamine feel with the odor that the dog gets with the marker because the odor predicts the down, which predicts the marker, which predicts the treat. So now just finding the odor itself is the dopamine release. And it's like, oh, wow, when we start to understand the science, we can start putting it in all kinds of different areas of dog training. I think that's the same way you teach it, at least based on some of the videos I watched of yours. The dog gets to the odor. You indicate, you reward, you build the drive, you connect the odor with something positive, 
and then you start teaching the dog the indication. I didn't get to the part where you teach the indication though. How do you do the yeah. indication? I, I was I was going for a, a down. Um but I think with truffles, I I think you kind of do want the dog to dig a bit. Um mm. but then but then you I want him to down on command like you know like like that and stop digging. Um so my perfect end result would be he would go and find the truffles. He would show me that it's a truffle because he's put his nose and he's started to dig. I would either give him the down command then or let him dig for another second or two and then down the command. And then if it really is a truffle that he would just stick his nose on it and stay still, giving me time. Because in the UK, truffles that grow here, they could they could be very close to the surface. So if he is at all tempted to, you know, put one in his in his chops and chew down on it, there could be, uh, you know, a few missing truffles if uh, he wasn't responsive to the to the down. But um, yeah, there's, there's, there's so many questions that keep coming up when you keep talking. But I should keep taking notes of the the things that keep popping on my mind because I've now forgotten two or three of them. But um, um, one do you find two, that um, do you find that you run into? I mean, this is it's very common in all the the scent detection work that I've done as far as bomb detection, narcotic detection, or cadaver. So those three, since they're different from tracking and search and rescue, they're all using the nose, but they're taught in different ways. And for those, one of the things we always have to navigate through is uh, false indications. So I'm assuming you run into those issues as well. When do you feel confident enough to take the dog that you're training into the field? So when do you feel like, okay, I've done enough on the pipes, I've gotten plenty of indications, the reliability is up there, I'm not getting as many false indications, or do you shoot for no false indications after a certain amount before you take your dog into the field, or does it not have a negative impact? Because, well, if he false indicates, whatever, you keep going and you have fun. I think there's a bit of that is just having fun. And, you know, I think if you were, you know, militant about it you would probably go through each beginner phase and get him to like you know 99 percent to 100 percent success at each very early phase and not skip ahead which is you know mm. i definitely skipped ahead you know 100 percent uh and but that was a learning curve in itself it's like okay i've skipped ahead and now why am i not getting the behavior and the results that i want oh it's because i've skipped ahead you know i've increased the, the distraction the the duration whatever and uh what do I need to do now? I need to go back to a couple steps before rehone that. Um, but yeah, it was, it was interesting. Uh, I think, I mean, just to waffle on a little bit more because I'm I've forgotten your question. But what I did, I definitely skipped ahead because to um, I got invited to go truffle hunting with Buddy in the UK with a seasoned truffle hunter uh, who had two truffle dogs, um, one of them more experienced than the other. And the way that I was hoping it was going to raise Buddy's game is that he's going to just shadow shadow this other dog and just get the sense of it, uh, which did happen. You know, this other dog was finding truffles left, right, and center, and then I would get Buddy to run or go near that area, and if he, you know, indicated on the same uh, spot, <clears throat> even though there wasn't a truffle there anymore, the thing is with truffles, the the soil all around gets mm. permeated with with the with the truffles very in a big way so i was still letting him dig and pretending as if there's a truffle there and then rewarding him um i don't know if that's the best way to, to do things i'm sure it had a positive impact because he found his first wild truffle uh on his own in in that you know somewhere else which the other dog hadn't seen so that worked I really well i would yeah. agree with that approach because if the odor is still there i mean essentially we want the dogs to find the odor yeah. And the odor leads to the item. So if he's indicated on the odor, he's doing his job because we want them to pick up the scent, not the visual. And if the scent was there, you're doing the training the right way. Yeah. At least the way I think. Makes sense to me. Good, good. Doing something right then. And the other thing I was going to ask you as well is is I've started um, just in, in game mode. Like when we're out and about and walk, I'll, I'll uh, hide certain objects and, and then mm -hmm. effectively fetch slash hide. Um, but now I started switching up the objects um, and getting him to scent out the different objects. So, for example, obviously one is a tennis ball, one is a little Kong. And then I, you know, I used a, a leather glove the other day. Um, 
and I don't know whether I read this or watched a video or just thought of the idea myself, but in order for him to know which, you know, I guess it's probably traditional tracking, right? Perhaps you get the, your, your dog sat waiting for you to give him the release command. Um, what I would do is just present him with the object I want him to go and find, like the glove. Uh, and I've started putting it on cue now. I've said smell smell here comes the put it in front of his nose and i'm sharing this so you can tell me if i'm doing it wrong or right um and then i'll walk off let him stay sat go to where he can't see me hide it somewhere obscure and then come back to where he can see me then release him and then just watch him hunt it down um and to be fair he's been smashing it um and i just wondered a is that a good approach and b where should i take it next well the success that you're having is a clear indicator that it's working Right. And yeah. that's what I was saying earlier. There's, you know, a dozen ways to skin a cat. For me, if you're able to get the results and the dog's having a good time, then yeah. it's an effective technique. Right. And so uh, that's something it sounds very similar to what I would do with like a, a, a knife search or gun search or key search. Right. These are things that are taught to dogs that mm. would do things like a felon search because if the dog is after a felon and that person had dropped a knife or something yeah. like that, that could help link up the the item with the person, fingerprints, whatever, right? So that was some of the training that I've done. And the way that I taught that was, um, first I would introduce the item to the dog and I would just toss it right in front of the dog. I would show him like a key and I would just toss it on the ground. Well, we know that's going to kick in the dog's curiosity what is known as their seeking drive, but they're also their, um, uh, their prey drive going after movement, curiosity seeking. So once they touch it with their nose or they get close to it, I would mark that. I would go free and they come back and get the reward. So now I'm building a reason for the dog to go and indicate, not indicate, but put their nose towards the key, which they're gonna naturally start to smell. And then I just start throwing it farther and ask the dog to do the same thing over mm. and over again. And then gradually I start to put the dog in a down and I would act like I'm hiding it in different areas, but I would let the dog see me. So I would walk away and then I'd act like I'm setting it down and I put it as if I'm putting it behind my, my shoe or boot or whatever. And then I'd walk to another spot, do the same thing. So the dog can't see where I'm setting it, but the dog has an idea because I've shown them all the different possible areas. Then I tell the dog search. The dog starts to look for it because that dog knows when they get to it, I'm going to use the terminal marker and reward them for it. Then the same way I would train the indication for any other scent work, once the dog gets to it, down, they or sit. If it was something like knife, I would have them probably do a stand. You don't want them laying on the knife. So if you have a strong stance day, and if, if I'm trying to build, if I'm trying to use a stand, if I'm doing something like a knife search, then I want to make sure I have a really solid stand command, but also where the dog can do it moving. So that's known as a stand in motion. It's a very difficult exercise to teach, but you'd want it to be that solid for something like that. So then when the dog gets to the odor, stand, free, reward. And standing, of course, is just no longer moving, just standing in one position. Or again, you can say down or sit or something like that. But I mean, the way that you're doing it seems to work just as good. And are you adding the uh, indication when your dog gets to it? No, I've sort of, I've stopped. Well, of recently, I've, I've probably been a bit lazy and uh, haven't really done too much of that. Um, mainly because I don't well, know really what I, yeah, huh? what was that? I said, it's easy, it's easy to start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and you were saying uh, earlier that um, you, you said you felt as though you rushed some of the training. Now, that is a common issue with everybody. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like we all do it. It's one of those things where we all pair our markers on accident. It's just natural. Separating the marker from the reward is very difficult for us to do as humans. And we all not necessarily skip steps, but we will progress probably faster because we, we learn faster than a dog does usually, right? So the dog needs more reps than what we're used to. But the beautiful thing about dog training is we're always able to go back steps. Yeah. And so anytime I progress too quickly, if I notice the dog's having a hard time, the dog's struggling, it's like, okay, I'll just go back a few steps. And that's something that I saw in scent work when I was doing something like having the dog search for the odor and the cinder blocks. I would do the same presentation each time because we don't want to have handler help where the dog starts picking up on something that we do, such as a double tap. 
oh, if he double taps on the cinder block, then that means that's where the odor is. So you have to have the same presentation every single time. And once the dog gets to the point where they start to connect the odor to the marker and the reward, but they're not 100% confident because what we want when we're doing scent work for, uh, and let me know if this is comparable to truffles, if we're doing it for, let's say, narcotic detection, you're telling the dog to search areas. So if it was a police officer, he might be in a warehouse and he's saying, search, 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 search. So the dog is searching all these locations. It's more of a guided search and less of an independent search. Yeah, yeah. And they want the dog to know when he gets to the odor, regardless of what the handler says at that point, to now ignore the handler's direction and guidance and indicate and say it's here. So you want to be able to go search, search, and as you continue to say search, the dog stops on the third one and goes, no, it's right here. Mm. But in the beginning, when they're not as confident, they'll, and you can see it if you're watching the dog, they get to the one that has the odor, you tell them to search in the next one, and they're, now they're, okay, do I, I'm supposed to listen, but I'm pretty sure this is the odor, and they'll go to where you tell them to search because they're relying on that guidance or because you've just done a lot of obedience. So they're, okay, I need to listen to you. Once you start to see that, then you go, okay, well, that's a clear indicator that the dog is understanding the work, but the confidence isn't there yet. And so what I'll do for that is I'll do more automatic rewards, meaning once the dog gets to it, I'm going to reward them. But then what I'm going to do is I'm going to start showing the dog the physical that leads or proceeds, I should say, after the location of the odor but remove the command. So then I'm presenting, so the dog's seeing the picture, but not hearing the command, just to make it a little bit easier. So they'll sorry, see explain, me Sorry, explain this one more time, sorry, just so right. I'm with you. Okay, yeah, so like, let's say I have six cinder blocks, and the odor's in one of those cinder blocks, so it's very easy to do the same presentation, and they're all on the ground, so we're not even dealing with different elevations at this point. And I tell the dog, search, I present the first one, search, I present the second one, search, I present the third one. And I go down the line, let's say the odor's in the third one. I say, search, the dog gets to it, and then I say, search on the fourth one, the dog hesitant, right? It looks over, looks back, but then goes to what I told them to do. So then mm. on the next one, I'm going to change the location of the odor by moving the cinder block, right? I'm not just gonna move the odor because the odor's still gonna be in that cinder block. So I move the cinder blocks around without the dog looking. So now let's say it's in the um, second cinder block. I'm gonna give the dog the one search command to start it. I'll present and then I'm gonna present the next one without saying search. The dog's gonna go to it because there's no odor. Then I'm gonna present the next one without saying search just to make it a little bit easier where I'm not adding a command, I'm just moving. And so then the dog is gonna be more likely to say, oh, it is here. Yeah. But if the dog follows me, then I say, okay, we really just need to do more reps. And that's usually what it, it ends up falling back on is we do a lot more reps because the dog's understanding the confidence or the, the concept, but the dog's not confident enough to say, you don't know what you're talking about, the odor's here. And some dogs, that could be more difficult than others, and it just depends on the training process. This is one of the reasons why military uh, scent detection dogs, primarily used for bomb detection, they want the dogs to be way more independent. They want the dog, you know, 40 feet in front of them, searching entirely on their own without any of that additional assistance from the handler. And I'm assuming that's probably more in the realm of truffle work as well. The dog's kind of independently searching after you give the, the command. I think so. I think that's the way that I want to go with it. Um, I mean, Buddy, he's, he's quite quick. So we cover a lot of ground uh, quite quickly, which is not always a good thing, right? Um, and so... Does he circle back? Yeah. Yeah, he circles back. That's good. Um, so he, does like, goes... he basically does little circles as he's progressing. Like he's yeah. smelling and he's coming back and he's like, all right, you're still with me. And he keeps yeah, going yeah. forward. He does check in. And, and I, do want to ask, I do want to ask you a question literally in this subject. But I think as it relates to um, uh, some principles that you taught me for the first time watching your videos, uh, the, the, I have to ask you this question first so everyone understands before I ask the next one. But what is the difference and what's the benefit of free shaping 
in terms of training what it what does this mean okay yeah so or, and uh, or just shaping yeah yeah the way i define it is a little different than what it's defined often online. So if you look up free shaping, you'll see a definition of slowly shaping a behavior through incremental steps. That is what I more would consider fixed shaping. To me, it makes sense because fixed, you have a fixed process of what you're trying to teach. So for example, I will use a little bit of fixed shaping for scent detection work. I like to use a client platform. This is what I learned from quite an exceptional trainer down in texas a uh, police officer down there buddy of mine marty the guy's awesome when it comes to training and scent work that's his main area of expertise but he's also quite the protection trainer and obedience trainer i mean he really is is top notch and i spent a few weeks down at his facility doing nothing but scent detection training and he taught me that technique because it builds some of that independence in the dog and it also helps with that uh, proactive training or the opera conditioning the dog starts to understand they can make rewards happen so he would put out this table and it's the same table that you see on my channel where it has the green um, grass you know artificial grass on top of it i learned that from him and so he would have that and he would have a puppy come in and he would just stand next to it and every time the puppy jumped up on it he would use a terminal marker he was using a clicker and he would reward the dog. Dog would jump up, click, he rewards the dog. So now the dog goes jumping up on this platform, gets me rewards, I like the rewards, I'm gonna keep doing it. After doing that for a few days, and these are all the puppies that he's imprinting to build that drive and that desire to do scent work. Then the next time he brings the puppy in after a few days, maybe a week, now instead of the climb platform being there by itself, there's now, uh, he would use often empty paint buckets. So he would just buy a bunch of paint buckets from the hardware store, and he would use those as containers for the scent. And so he would have an empty paint bucket now sitting on top of the climb platform. The dog would come in, jump up on the climb platform, and naturally and instinctively investigate this new item that's on there that wasn't there before. The moment the dog would stick its head into the container, he would mark that and reward. So now the dog is going, oh, we jump up on the platform, we stick our head in the container, we get the reward. So now they're seeking out that. So to me, that's a good example of fixed shaping. You might also see this with a trainer teaching a dog to ride a skateboard. There's different ways of doing that as well. Uh, like there's a trainer, there's a trainer out in Los Angeles who works with, um, a lot of Hollywood producers, so his dogs are often the dogs that you'll see in movies and whatnot that he works with. And one of the ways that he'll teach a dog to ride a skateboard is he'll have a set of stairs, like a, just stairs by itself, something that you might use to help a little dog get on top of a bed. And he'll have these stairs that he builds, and he'll have the dog go up and down it just over and over and over again. And then one day he has the dog go up and he puts a skateboard at the bottom. Now the dog goes down the way that they always went and they hit the skateboard and then he rewards the dog once they're on the skateboard and they, it starts to move. So he starts to build a strong association with that. But that's distracting from the original point. So fix shaping for me is I have something in mind I want the dog to do, but I'm not directly showing the dog by presenting a physical cue. I'm hoping the dog will figure it out on their own. Free shaping, the way that I, I teach and explain it is we don't have anything in mind that we want the dog to do but we're gonna start rewarding behaviors that we see the dog perform that we like. So any behavior, and this is something I even recommend anybody, because it does create two things. One, it creates the proactive dog, the dog that's actively seeking out behaviors to get us to reward them. And then number two, it starts to show the dog that, well, they have an impact on their environment, but they can make rewards happen. There was another point, I just, I lost it. I lost it. I had, I had something else with that. But anyways, um, so, oh yes, I remember the other one. It teaches them that we're cookie dispensers is what I like yeah. to call it. You know, because we know that dogs do everything based on motivation and something that people have commented in my videos, they go, oh, you just give your dog a bunch of treats. I could do that. Well, when you're first teaching a dog a new behavior, you do continual reinforcement. You reward every single correct repetition. But you do have to start spacing out the rewards to get the dog to the point where they can do multiple behaviors and then eventually get the reward. But when they're doing obedience, most dogs don't go into a sit and a down because they like going into a sit and a down. They go into a sit and a down for the possibility of getting to play tug with their human or getting a treat or some kind of reward. 
Well, if the dog is not doing the behavior for the possibility of getting a reward, then the only other option is they're doing the behavior because they're being forced or because they're preventing the possibility of a correction. Ideally, I like a dog to work for that possibility of getting a reward. Now, most dogs, their behavior is driven by the reward, and all dogs start off this way. We show them the treat. The dog goes, ooh, there's a treat. The dog sits. We give them the treat. The dog did the behavior because they saw the reward. Doing free shaping helps establish that the dog starts to understand that their behavior can drive the actual production of the reward. They don't see the reward, but they know that their behavior can make it appear. And then later on, when you tell your dog down, your dog looks at you and you don't have a treat, but they go, you always have payment. You always have treats. And they do the behavior whether or not they can see the reward. And that's the real added value. So the proactive training and then teaching them that we are cookie dispensers, we're rich, and we always have a way to pay. Nice. Very well explained. And and I'm not even sure if this is going to be the foundation of my next question, but um. So one of the things that I've, I guess, confused about and not sure if I'm doing it right. Um, so with scent work and I'm out in the field and doing something and I've always lent on, you know, giving the command, whether it's for me, it's probably uh, find it or I do have a, a unique command for when we're doing truffle stuff. Uh, I just I put into Google Translate, what does find it mean in in Italian? And uh, it's, it came out travel. So uh I use that command for uh, when he's nice. finding truffles, but um, I always try and stay completely deadpan silent and, you know, just give him the command and he's just running around looking for the scent. Um, and I don't engage and I don't repeat the command either. I don't like travel or travel or travel or find it, find it, find it. But like I've been on quite a few truffle hunts now with people and I see other things and people are just going, find it, find it. Where is it? Where is it? You know, uh, or, or saying some other distracting word um, rather than just letting them, you know, stepping back and just letting them zone in and, and do it. And I just wondered what would be your take on it? Maybe in other scent fields that you've done this similar stuff for, and would you also transfer that to the truffle world? If you were to be training a dog to hunt truffles, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's it, the way that you're doing it sounds more like an independent search. You give the command, your dog knows what to do, and he starts to work. It also shows that he has good perseverance. He is able to continue to work even without the instant gratification of a reward. Now, trainers that I've worked with that will repeat the command, they'll often repeat it when the dog is looking at them for guidance. So dogs will look at us if they're having a hard time, they're not able to find it, and this was something that a lot of students would do during the key search requirement. That was a requirement at the Tom Rose School. They would tell the dog the initial search. The dog would start searching, but then the dog would come back to them for guidance. Like, ah, oh, what am I doing? And they'd be like, you're still searching. And then the dog would go do it again. And that's, again, usually just an indicator that the dog either, A, needs more help. They don't have as high of perseverance. That's how they were taught or they've done a lot of obedience. And when we do a lot of obedience with dogs, then they're gonna be more likely to look at us for that additional mm. guidance. Whereas what we were saying earlier with the bomb detection dogs with the, and this is what a lot of protection people will do this as well. They'll start with the activity with no obedience. So they'll start a puppy, just you come onto the field, you pull like crazy and you bite, that's all you do. You come, you bite, it's fun. There's no requirements. You don't have to sit down, nothing. There's no pre-max principle, we just want you to bite. So they're trying to build that independent drive to do the bite work without having any additional distraction from the handler where the dog's looking back like, am I biting? What am I doing, right? So that's what I'm seeing. It's just more of that independent style training, which will serve someone well when you're doing long, long searches. Okay, cool. So yeah, potentially moving in the right direction with that. Um, and I guess yeah, it, may yeah. de it depends on the dog you have, right? Because as you said, Buddy does have pretty good uh, uh, duration with his search and his drive. Um, the but then if you didn't have, a, yeah, that's what I mean, perseverance. So. Yeah, that's a huge, huge part of it. That's something when I was working with Marty down in Far Texas that I was telling you about, when he would evaluate a dog, he would bring out three different, I think I'm saying this right, he'd bring out three different pipes, a um, PVC pipe, a metal pipe and a copper pipe and he would throw this would be one of the first tests so he'd throw the pvc pipe and he wants the dog to run at it pick it up and kind of run around with it 
the dog does that then he would throw the metal pipe wants the same thing and the copper was the final test so the dog's like picking up a copper pipe and running around with it okay that's test number one and that's showing that the dog has a prey drive play drive and is not going to be deterred from a little bit of copper which apparently that's not pleasant to have in your mouth after that he would do a perseverance test he would make sure the dog likes toys if the dogs don't like toys then they're not going to work and he would take the toy that the dog wants and he would put it in a location that was impossible for the dog to get to and then he would time how long the dog would try to get to the toy before they gave up or looked for help and he wanted the dogs that would never give up that would keep trying and trying and trying before walking away you know and there's a, and this is why most people that do any sort of working type stuff with their dogs whether it's scent work protection obedience they want the dogs with the highest drive the highest motivation because we can use that for the training mm. now going back to what you're saying too it does also right we, let, let's just assume all the dogs we're talking about have pretty high perseverance the way you train is going to have an impact on that as well so if we think about for example tracking for schutzen and it made me think of something you you said earlier when you were talking about the competition when we start doing competition with dogs, we're trying to separate the best dogs from the dogs that are not as good. And in order to do that, there has to be factors that separate the best from the good. Well, in the very beginning, when we're starting, it might just be, okay, we're going to lay a track if I'm using tracking as an example. The dog has to find the articles, indicate, make the turns, and then get to the end. And that's a perfect. Well, that might have worked in the very beginning, but then they start to find that every dog is passing and getting a perfect okay now we have to make it harder if the dog veers off the track by two feet they're going to lose points now all of a sudden every dog's doing that perfectly now they go okay if the dog lifts their head at all off the track and doesn't indicate perfectly they're going to lose points and if the handler has to repeat the command to track too many times they're going to lose points so then these trainers start to adjust their training in order to get that perfect picture that's why precision obedience and competition over the years as we start to understand how to work with our dogs better and better. And uh, if you're not familiar with Michael Ellis, awesome trainer, I learned a lot from him. He talks about it in one of his videos. He says, look at the training from Schutzen 40 years ago, 50 years ago, and look at the training now. Completely different animal. The dogs perform better. They're happier about it. There's more motivation. And it's because we've gotten better at understanding and training our dogs and it's not as much of that you know what we were talking about earlier yank and crank or i have to dominate the dog more so it's working with the dog towards a common goal so when we're doing something like tracking we have to start to teach the dog that independent track so we're not out there going track 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 and just losing all of our points and not being able to qualify so mm -hmm. then you adjust the training for that so i think it does come down to the training and some people are just you know if there's no negative um consequences to repeating search a bunch of times right if they're not being good that's tested. that's that's definitely a question i was going to ask you nick is there a downside to yeah as you said doing find it find it find it if you're oh. competing right i mean i i'm pretty yeah, confident compete. for i could be wrong i haven't looked at the rules in a long time but i'm pretty confident in shits and tracking if you say track a bunch of times you're going to lose points you can't be out there saying track you basically you get to the starting point of the track you have a 20 foot long line and you tell your dog track and that's it and off they go and they have to follow the track and when they get to the articles they have to indicate once they indicate you can't even tell them to indicate you walk up you pick up the article you show it to the judge judge gives you the thumbs up you put it away track and then the dog goes again so the only time i think you're allowed to repeat the track command is after the dog has yeah. indicated on an article and you're telling them to continue the search. But outside so of I competition, the rules... there's no downside that you think of, really, you know, within reason I mean, or, you know. Yeah, I mean, if as long as you're okay with the dog looking at us for constant guidance, you know, if you want to start working more on an independent search where you're just giving your dog the task and you're just following behind them. So I guess it would really just come down to personal preference. Yeah, yeah. You know? Okay, cool. Because I thought I was doing a disservice to his ability in the future of being a good truffle dog by repeating that command too many times. Um, but uh, that's cool. Give me some confidence there. It's all good. Um, yeah, mate, I think it's great. I was just going to say, like, um, it, 
I think it's a perfect time to to wrap up because I'm sure you've uh, got your day to be cracking on with, and you've given me more more than more time than I was expecting from you. So, and it's been fantastic. So um, yeah, I appreciate you, this. Yeah, and I, I just had, wanted I a, to a lot invite. Of, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no, sorry. I want to invite you now. Whenever you're over in the UK, uh, and if it's truffle season, um, hook me up, and we I'll take you ch- to some spots, um, and we can go truffle hunting. Oh, that would be awesome. You have to make sure you link me up with a good videographer out there so we can get some good footage for the channels. Yeah, that would be awesome, definitely. Um, And without further ado, one last thing I just want to say, if anyone wants to come check you out, uh, where would you want to send them? If they just search Nate Shomer, they'll find all my platforms. So I'm pretty much Nate Shomer on Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, but my main one is going to be YouTube. YouTube. So just search for Nate Shomer on YouTube and definitely check out uh, Nate's videos. They were really awesome. And you put out a lot of good content as well. Um, what's what's next for you with uh, videos and projects that you're working on? Oh, yeah. So this this year, I'm really trying to up my game on the YouTube platform. So my goal moving forward this year is 20 shorts per month and then four standard normal episodes per month i have a really nice high-end videographer team so i'm working with this team the first time on the 22nd of this month so hopefully that goes really well i have a new thumbnail team that i'm working with and i have a graphics guy who's going to add some interesting graphics and some things to really maintain that view retention from people you know there's the people that love dog training they're trying to learn and then there's the people that just want entertaining dog content now i'm yeah. trying to please both <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Awesome. Well, um, thank you so much. And uh, I hope we connect again in the future. And uh, I look forward to seeing some more of your videos. Yeah, definitely. When you have millions of followers and subscribers on your podcast, I expect to come back and do another one. Absolutely. You'll be welcome. (laughs) No doubt. All right. Well, thanks again. I really appreciate it. Take it easy, man.